Hello, everyone. There's so many wonderful humans here tonight. I see so many of you. Thank you for coming to Passion Projects. This is the first talk of 2014. Yeah, we're going to have a really big year, and I'm happy all of you are here to see it, or to join us with it, for it, for it. Um, my name is Julie, and I am the creator and organizer of Passion Projects here at GitHub. I'm also a designer and developer here. So um, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And I wanted to ask you to join me in welcoming Dana McCallum. <laughs> How's my mic? Is that okay? A little screeching? All right. Well, thank you, Julie. Uh, it's an incredible honor to be here. I've been really impressed with the other talks in the series and just how professionally this whole thing has been put together. Uh, so it's really exciting to be, to be asked to be a part of this. Um, just to give you a little background on me, uh, I'm an engineer at Twitter. I've been there about four years. Uh, so I've watched the company grow from 150 people to thousands uh, from doing 500 tweets a second to, I don't even know how many hundreds of thousands we did on Japanese New Year, but um, it's been completely overwhelming. When I started, we didn't even have ID badges, and now I walk into the cafeteria and I'm like, who are all these people? <laughs> what are you doing at my company? Um, they're all welcome, they're all great. Um, <laughs> so that's been pretty exciting. My first, uh, I joined as, um, an engineer on the API. I was just kind of a you know frontline grunt on the API or whatever. Uh, but then I got moved up to the lead engineer on the API, which was super exciting. So I did that for two years. Uh, and then I moved over to help build our advertising API. Um, and I'm just now moving off of that onto our social graph service, which is the system that keeps track of like who follows who and who's blocking who and so on and so forth. Um, I can't promise I'll be able to fix the unfollow bug, but I'm sure gonna try. So. Um, so that's what I do at Twitter. Before I started at Twitter, I, uh, I lived in Indiana, uh, which was, oh, another Hoosier here. OK, great. <laughs> one of my, I used to say that I was a Hoosier expat in my Twitter bio, and one of my coworkers from England thought that I was saying I was a hoser. <laughs> so he thought I was Canadian for the longest time, which is fine, OK. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know, I, I did a bunch of sort of random programming. There's not a whole lot of interesting tech going on in Indiana, unfortunately. But um, I worked, uh, the last job I had was at a newspaper. I built a lot of like random social media sites. Uh, I helped build a site for moms, which is pretty great. Uh, every Friday I would descend into this like crazy flame war between like the super conservative, you know, homeschool helicopter parents and the, like the pagan earth mother let the child do whatever they can name themselves and so on and so forth. And they would just go and just, it was so great, so good for page views. Um, <laughs> uh, so that was pretty great. And then uh, the other site that we built was a site for pets, not a site for pet owners, a site for pets. Uh, you would sign up, you would sign up as your dog or as your cat, and then you would write messages to other animals as your dog or cat. Uh, that was not so great for page views. Um, but it did produce my all-time favorite thing ever on the internet, which was somebody, you know, writing as their dog. Uh, this woman was, you know, her dog was very excited that she'd come home. She's like, yay, mom's home, great, it's so great. She, you know, says hi to me and now I get treats and she gives me kisses. And she's really mad at dad. I hope dad stops being a jerk. <laughs> so... Somewhere out there, someone is working out their marriage problems by role-playing their pet on, on the internet. Uh, I also do quite a bit of work on the side for women in tech. That's, you know, writing talks and uh, traveling and so on. I went to India with the State Department uh, this last spring, which was freaking amazing. Um, all of this stuff, uh, all of this stuff, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about all this stuff. I'm super passionate about all of it. Uh, and I'm, you know, I, I would love to take questions about it in Q&A. Um, but every now and then, I do get a little burnt out on being a woman in tech. Uh, sometimes I just want to be an engineer, you know. Um, and I feel like even if, even if you aren't devoting yourself to uh, sort of the, the women in tech movement. Um, you know, if you are a woman in tech, you still kind of have this sense that, like, 
you're sort of representing all of womanhood, or um, you know, people are sort of watching you differently, and so on. Um, so I want to make this talk, at least the the, the pure talk portion of it, just about tech, if I may. Um, and then you know, Q and A, you can ask me whatever you want. Um, so it, it was it was kind of hard to come up with uh, with a topic for this. It's so open ended, uh, and you know, the talks before this have been about so many different things. Um, you know, and I'm not, I'm not really like a motivational speaker. I'm more like a demotivational speaker. Uh, like if I had started Kickstarter, I would have made it so that you pay people not to do things. <laughs> like, no, please, please do not. Please do not write that book. I will pay you so much money not to write that book. Uh, so, you know, so that's, that stuff was out. But, you know, it's right there in the title, passion projects. So what are the projects that I've been super passionate about besides Twitter and women in tech and so on. Um, and there, there are a few projects that, uh, that I've done and um, sort of the common theme behind all of them is that uh, they combined my interest in programming and technology with something else that was not necessarily tech related uh, that I was super into. And I don't, and by super into, I mean like I get super crazy into stuff. Uh, you know, if I get interested in something, I'm like, it keeps me up reading about it at night. Uh, it's, you know, I drive my friends totally batshit crazy because it's the only thing I talk about, um, and so on and so forth. My thing right now is the Norse myths, but I won't bore you with that right now. Uh, except to say that you should read the Wikipedia article on Volva. It's V-O-L-V-A with an umlaut. It's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> There's like, there were these Viking sorceresses that basically ran around like drugging men and Anyway, it was really cool. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so the you know, so the first one of these, I tried to teach myself Japanese, uh, which was idiotic. Um, I do I, about the only thing I remember from that endeavor uh, is the phrase "wakari masen," which means I don't understand. Uh, it's a good thing to know. Uh, I also remember um, "moshi moshi," which is how you say hello on a telephone. Um, but I did, uh, I found this whole data set put together by this professor in Australia who, you know, he studies Japanese and that's all he does. And so he created this huge XML data set of uh, Japanese to English dictionary and kanji correspondences and all that stuff. So I put that together into this website, which uh, I haven't touched in like five years. And you can see the CSS hasn't aged very well because some of the characters are kind of chopped off. Um, I thought about fixing that, but I was like, whatever. Uh, <laughs> when, I, when I stop being into something, then I just don't care about it at all. Um, oh, I don't, I don't know if you can read that, but this is also one of my favorite Japanese words. It's kuroshi. It means death, death from overwork. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a real thing. Um, so when I, uh, when I was interviewing at Twitter, I was staying in a hotel out here, and I got the, and the phone rang, and I wasn't expecting any calls, and I pick it up, and I hear this woman say moshi moshi on the other end of the line, and I'm like, well, that's strange. Like, who's going to call me speaking Japanese? Uh, except for my friend Joanna, who sometimes calls me and says, domo haruge desu, which is, hello, I'm hard gay, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> Anyway, this woman said moshi moshi, and I'm like, I'm sorry, you've got the wrong number. And then she said moshi moshi again. I'm like, okay, she doesn't speak English. And most people at this point would just hang up, right? But I'm like, no, I remember the other thing I know how to say in Japanese, which is nihongo ga dekimasen, I don't speak Japanese. Uh, and then I hung up. And I just, I love imagining. <laughs> I love imagining how confused this woman, presumably from Japan, must have been calling America, uh, getting an American on the phone who then said, I don't speak Japanese in Japanese. Um, so that was this project. This project taught me a lot about uh, character encoding, as you might imagine. Um, they screwed up a lot of databases and a lot of Ruby code. Ruby's support for Unicode at this time was just terrible, uh, mostly because um, Japanese technology professionals don't really like Unicode because it kind of screwed them over. Um, but anyway, so that taught me a lot about that, uh, and that was really fun to put together. Uh, and the next thing I worked on, I got really into nutrition, which is pretty exciting, uh, I guess. Uh, I wasn't into that for very long. I didn't actually finish that app because I realized that I like pizza more than living forever. So... Um, <laughs> But I did find, I uh, found another great data set here, this time from the US Department of Agriculture. It's a food database, 
Uh, and it's, you know, it's just a bunch of ASCII files. Um, and you would imagine ASCII files, one record per row, or per line, rather, it's probably going to be tab delimited, right? No, the food database is caret delimited. <laughs> wah, wah. That's true. I'm not making that up. That's um, it's pretty ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, uh, but the thing that I'm, that I'm super into and have always been super into for you know as long as I've been an adult basically has been uh, aviation. And so uh, this is the plane I was flying 10 years ago. It's just a little tiny two-seater deal. Um, pretty sporty though. It's pretty you know it's a little pretty thing. Kind of want to make out with it. Um, it's. Uh, I, I referred to this as my Mazda Miata with wings, so that was fun. Um, so, but uh, I got, you know, I have a commercial pilot's license, uh, which is not an airline pilot's license. That's a totally different thing. Um, but uh, where was I going with that? So, yeah, so anyway, I, you know, I, so I had this airplane and I wanted to do something that was, you know, that tied my interest in technology to aviation. Um, and again, there are tons and tons of great data sets out there uh, for, you know, airspace and uh, airways, where airports are, you know, whether they've got fuel and like just everything you can possibly imagine and more is out there. Um, this being 10 years ago, though, uh, the, the technology platforms at the time were a little limited. And so what I had to work with was uh, the Palm 5X. Who, does ever, who here does not know what a Palm Pilot was? Okay, I was worried about that. I was going to ask, like, who here is under 25? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, this device had a 20 megahertz processor, 8 megabytes of memory. That's combined RAM and storage. Um, they were the same thing. Uh, tiny little grayscale screen, and most embarrassing of all, it had a stylus. Um, and then programming on the Palm Pilot was, uh, posed some unique challenges because... Um, you can't make you can't make what are called long jumps, which means that uh, if you've got let's say we've got a function called heading, you know, it calculates your heading to a waypoint or whatever, um, and that heading function needs to call a cosine function. That's fine as long as the cosine function is close to the heading function in memory. Uh, if you then need to call your div f function and it's too far away, can't do it. There just are, there literally are not enough bits in the assembly instruction to call a subroutine to make it that far. Um, and of course, the linker that, uh, that Palm provided was not smart enough to rearrange your code for you. So you had to like, basically had to hand arrange how your code was arranged in memory to get anything to work properly. Um, and, you know, in case you're wondering why you had to call a function called divide float, it's because there was no floating point instructions in the processor, so you had to do all that stuff in software. Um, so that was fun. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, it also has no GPS, but you could get like a little attachment thingy, excuse me, that would, uh, it would attach to the back end, uh, would attach onto the, the back of the Palm Pilot, and then there's a serial port, and then it would feed you like, GPS data via this like bizarre text format that you then had to parse. Um, so pretty constrained platform, but you know most of the necessary components are there. Uh, but this you know this amazing beast was the thing that I was going to take to deal with this nonsense. Um, what the hell is this? This is an aeronautical chart of central and southern Indiana. Uh, I don't expect anyone to be able to read anything on here. Uh, first of all, because no one is familiar with Indiana geography, except for one person. Um, second of all, because very, I'm sure if there are any other pilots here, I'll be surprised. Um, and also because this map is missing sort of a basic feature that we all have grown accustomed to find on maps, which is the ground. Uh, there is no ground on this map. There is another kind of aeronautical chart. This is the same area uh, that does show the ground. There are roads and you know, towers and lakes and so on and so forth. Um, but this, this kind of map is designed for if you're flying in bad weather. And so you're probably in the clouds, you can't see the ground, so what's the point in putting it on a map? Um, one, one feature uh, that I do want to describe here quickly is uh, you see this sort of like web of black lines all over the place? Those are, uh, those are called airways, and they're basically highways in the sky. Um, Strictly speaking, you don't have to follow those. You can go wherever you like. 
uh, but most, you know, it's, it's beneficial to take them because they're pre-planned and they know exactly which altitudes you're supposed to be on and blah, blah, blah. There's all sorts of reasons to do that. So just like you, oh, and they all have numbers. So just like you might say, you know, I'm driving to San Jose, I'm taking 101. Um, if you're flying from Indianapolis to Bloomington, you can say I'm taking 305. There's, a, there's an airway called 305 that goes there. So, um, and then there, these airways are sort of arranged in spokes around navigation beacons. And so you can sort of bounce off of, uh, you can sort of take them and sort of bounce off of the beacons as you get there. So um, you can go from like the 305 to like 220 and so on and so forth. Um, and that like, well, you can skirt around restricted airspace and so on if you do that. Uh, so let's, let me declutter this to make it a little, let's kind of focus on just a few components here. Um, so here we have, we have one airway. Uh, this is 221. That little blue circle up there, that's Indianapolis International. Um, so you don't want to go there without permission, because they'll probably get mad at you. Um, and then the weird polygonal thing down at the bottom, that's called an MOA, or Military Operations Area. There's like fighter jets and artillery shells exploding there, so best to avoid that. Um, so this is the environment that I was trying to, trying to work in to get a Palm Pilot to fly me around safely without getting hit by an artillery shell or in trouble with Indianapolis International. Um, so, you know, how, how do we design this thing? Well, the most, the most basic design might be just have an arrow, right? You know where you're trying to go. Um, just have a little, little screen that says, it's that way, go that way. Uh, the problem with that is there's wind in the air, uh, and so if you just point the nose of an airplane at the thing that you're trying to go, you're probably not going to get there in a straight line. You're going to end up drifting off course, and then we blow up. I was, I was going to make a flame transition there, but it seems like <laughs> there's probably nervous flyers here, and I didn't want to, like... <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> Um, so what you have to do instead is you have to, you have to turn the plane into the wind and you kind of fly sideways like that. Um, so if we've got wind coming out of the north, we've got to like, we've got to counteract that drift by keeping the nose trip, uh, pointed that way. So this is called crabbing because crabs go sideways. Um, and it happens on every, every flight you've ever been on. You just haven't noticed because you've been up too high. Uh, even if there's no wind on the ground, the wind up at altitude could be like 100 miles an hour. So. Um, sort of key to getting where you're trying to go. Um, but this, this factor makes it so that you can't just make a thing that says, go that way. Uh, and so what they came up with is an instrument called a horizontal situation indicator. Um, the aviation industry really loves its acronyms and like ridiculously long words. Uh, if, a, if a plane flies into a mountain, it's not a crash, it's controlled flight into terrain, for example. Uh, uh, it's my favorite euphemism ever. But so, so this is basically just like a compass, right? We have the compass, there's a ring around that, shows us which direction we're going. And then, uh, so that'll, if we turn the airplane, then that compass ring will turn with it, so we know which direction we're going. And then that line in the middle there, that's the airway. So there's another, there's like a dial where you can dial in like which airway you want to go on. And then that, and so then it knows like, oh, you are to the left of the airway and you're approaching it at a 45 degree angle. So, so this airplane is going to hit that airway and then it's going to turn and then it'll be fine. Um, and so that's essentially what I built on the Palm Pilot. Uh, and so we have, you know, a similar situation here. We've got, we're slightly to the left of the airway and we're, approaching it from the side, and then we're going to turn and then uh, go straight along that. And then, you know, there's all sorts of other information you can provide here since we've got GPS. Like, we know we're 19 miles away from the thing we're going to. It's probably going to take us 12 minutes to get there. Uh, we're roughly 3,500 feet and so on and so forth. Um, what was next? Yeah, so I mentioned the GPS device it gives you this like crazy text format. Uh, this, I, this thing called the NMEA, which is like the National Marine, uh, they, I, I don't really know who they are, but they, they designed this standard for uh, systems on boats to talk to each other and somehow we ended up using that for airplanes and GPS devices too. Um, like even even like raw GPS chipsets will send this like stupid text format to whatever el whatever other thing it's attached to um, on the device you've got. 
Uh, so this is, you know, but it, it gives you everything you need, um, and you know, it'll update you periodically and so on and so forth. So just parse that, and then you're good to go. And then, of course, you also need to know where airports are. So how do we do that? Um, oh, sorry, let me back up just a sec. So once we've got that, we know where the airport is, we know where we are, we know which way we're pointed. Uh, at that point, it's just a simple trigonometric problem, right? And it's, it's a little, it's not quite simple because you have to project the triangle onto a sphere or a spheroid, perfectly spherical cow. Um, no one knows what joke I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> You know, but at, at short distances, this is a perfect, this is a fine approximation. So, so that works out pretty well. And then you can figure out exactly like how far off you are and which direction you need to point to get there, blah, blah, blah. So that's great. Um, but how do we know where the thing is we're going to? Well, um, US government to the rescue again. At the time, there was a database called the Digital Aeronautical Flight Information File, uh, which covered the entire world. It was uh, compiled by the, the military and then they gave it out for free, which seems kind of strange. Um, but, you know, they don't anymore, so I guess that's not very strange. I don't know. Uh, that, so that, unfortunately, that data is not available anymore, but you can get the coded instrument flight procedures, um, which, you know, another aviationism. It's just aviation data, uh, but that costs a little bit, little bit of money from the, from the FAA. Um, so that's, that's pretty great. So what are, what are the learnings is not a word. Uh, neither, that's a thing you do with food. Okay, lessons, that's a word, okay. Um, so what, you know, what can we learn from all of this stuff from my experience here? Uh, you know, if you wanna work with data sets, the US government has tons of it. They're just out there, as we know now, collecting all kinds of data and all kinds of things. Uh, <laughs> some of it they give away, probably not, probably not your phone calls, but um, you know. That's for the best, I guess. Uh, so it's all housed on, you know, there's, there's this, uh, you can go to data.gov and they've collected all of the various data sets that they're making from, you know, carrot delimited food databases to, uh, there's, a, there's a UFO sightings database. One of my coworkers, one of my coworkers uh, correlated the UFO sightings database with uh, the drug convictions database. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty awesome. Um, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and then the other thing is that these kinds of projects, they can simultaneously level up your tech skills and your skills in whatever your other interest happens to be. Uh, you know, I mean, every aviator has to learn some basic navigation skills. Uh, but, you know, this project really, like, took it to the next level for me and really made me think about exactly how all the math works and all that stuff. Um, and then on top of that, I had to work within the constraints of this incredibly uh, restricted system. Um, which in a strange way sort of prepared me for uh, some of the work that I do at Twitter, uh, which is the next point. You know, if you work, I, you know, I encourage people to work in environments that they're not familiar with. If you're, if you're a web developer, make a desktop app. If you're a web designer, you know, do some design that's not for the web and so on. Um, and you can be pretty surprised what you learn. The, the work that I did on, uh, on the navigation system, um, it's, it's similar to working at scale in the sense that you really have to get the most out of every little tiny bit that you're working with. You've got to get the most out of the CPU. You've got to get the most out of your memory. Um, you know, obviously the difference with working at scale is that you've got tons and tons of machines, but the demand is also very high. So, um, but the end result as far as, you know, uh, what you have to do as a programmer is, is very similar. Um, so, uh, that's my talk. I'm Dana Danger, and if you want to see the code for that system, it's up on my GitHub account, Dana Danger slash Skynav. Um, it's all written in C and for an ancient operating system that doesn't exist, but it might be interesting if you're, <laughs> if, you, if you'd like to see, uh, you know, how the navigation works in particular. Um, so thanks for listening, and I'll see you at Q&A. That was, can we give another round of applause for Dana? <laughs> Such an amazing person. <laughs> I personally have been like a really big fan of Dana's like just through the community and on Twitter, just, you know, stalking her every word, you know, that kind of thing. 
which is totally normal, right? Um, <laughs> but I'm really, uh, we're really honored to have you, so thank you. Um, so normally, one of the first questions I ask is, like, did you have an aha moment with programming or computers? Like, even when we were little, like, what was your oh shit moment? Yeah. Uh, my oh shit moment. Gosh. I, um, it's all kind of a blur at this point because I started programming when I was like eight or nine. Uh, I guess I'm a Paul Graham approved programmer. <laughs> I just, oh. Shout out. Oh, now I'm in trouble. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, I mean, the thing that I always really wanted to do was build uh, a role-playing game, which I still haven't done. So um, maybe when I get a chance to take some time off, I'll do that. Uh, but I just got really into programming for programming's sake, and then I decided, I, like, when I was a teenager, I thought I wanted to be a professor. My dad is a professor, so that always seemed really cool. Um, so, yeah. Did you go to school for programming then? No, I did not go to school. I went to Arizona State for, like, a week. Uh, <laughs> uh, and As I, one does. And I, and I would like to say that my decision to leave was, like, very thoughtful and deliberate, but, you know, I mean, I was 18. Nothing that an 18-year-old does is thoughtful or deliberate. So um, that's I, I give a lot of talks to high schoolers, and that's always, like, a point of awkwardness between me and the teachers who are hosting me. They're like, oh, where'd you go to school? And I'm like, I uh, didn't, and I got bad grades in high school. So, ta-da! <laughs> Here I am, love me. Um, okay, so, so you um, are fairly well known in like the open source community. What was the first open source project you contributed to? Do you remember, or a favorite open source project? But if you do say Bootstrap, I will have to play you off the stage. Oh, hell no. No, I mean, I do not write JavaScript, okay. <laughs> um, gosh. I think, honestly, I think the first one I, contributed to was, uh, I don't even remember what it's called anymore. It was, it's a software load balancer. I think it's just called balance. I don't remember. Um, but I didn't, I, I needed a, a different strategy for allocating connections to the, to hosts. Um, and, uh, and it didn't support the one that I wanted. So I added it and that was that. Cool. So that was pretty cool. I actually haven't, I haven't done a whole lot of open source contributions, which kind of bums me out. Um, you know, more just for lack of time than anything else. Yeah. Uh, so you're obviously a woman of so many talents, so many things. Uh, you're a licensed pilot, as you um, went through in your talk a little bit. Um, but you also study like crazy foreign languages, like Celtic, and just unless you're just trolling the internet, like I like I'm pretty sure you do those things. Are there <laughs> are there are there any others that um, any other hobbies that you know? Uh, you have right now or that you're interested in right now? Uh, not so much right now. I'm trying, I'm trying to get back into playing bass. Uh, I, played, I, played, I played bass in marching band in high school, if you can imagine that. Uh, I did not actually march. I just had, a, I had an amp with a car battery. Um, <laughs> and they just like stuck me on the sidelines and then I played bass. Um, so anyway, I'm trying to get back into that because that's really fun. Uh, I was making chain mail for a while. That was... <laughs> <laughs> it's really boring. It's the most boring thing I've ever done. I mean, you're just you're just knitting with metal. It's awful. How did you pick that up? Like, what what inspired you? Like, were you reading Chaucer? Like, what do you? <laughs> uh, I think I oh gosh, somebody I somebody sent me a link to uh, to this this woman's website. She makes chainmail jewelry, which is totally awesome. And I was like, oh, I can do that. Surely. Surely she hasn't invested tons of her time and energy into right. perfecting this craft. I can just right. do it overnight. Yeah. How white male of you. Like, you know, how like... <laughs> way to nail, you know, like, way to like take that back. Like for us, you know? Yeah. yeah. Women, women in chain mail. That's my new going to be me and one other person. Yeah. <laughs> Do you need a website? I'm available. I can. Okay. Yeah. No, great. Um, awesome. Okay. So, uh, so my next thing was literally, okay, tell us about flying, but you told us so much about, about that already. So my next question is, when are you going to space? Oh God. So there, <laughs> this is my favorite thing ever. There, there, so Axe body spray. I don't know if you all, yeah. Any story that starts with Axe body spray. <laughs> either ends in hilarity or sadness. Um, 
So they they ran this promotion where they were gonna uh, they were gonna I don't even know if it was just a sweepstakes or you had to like write an essay. No, you do not have to write essays for Axe Body Spray. What am I saying? <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, they were they were gonna send somebody into space on one of those like suborbital flights, you know, like the spaceship one or whatever. It wasn't spaceship one, but it was the same deal. Um, and they were like, and it was this like super gendered thing. They were like, be the first like bro in space or whatever, you know. It's like, hey get, man, have get some... smear not iced in space. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> have the first natty light in space. Uh, and so I was like, wouldn't it be fucking hilarious if Axe Body Spray had to send the first trans woman ever into space? <laughs> yeah. So I tried to do that, but obviously I didn't win. So. Or is it, you're missing your like headband and your like AV. You gotta like have the style no, I know. to bro, to win that bro yeah. contest. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Um. So, where have you flown? Like, where have you where have you personally like? What are your flight paths that you've taken? Um, most of the flying I did was in Indiana. That's where I learned how to do it. Um, I've, I haven't done a whole lot of flying out here, um, partially because, uh, you know, I've been, uh, Twitter is a big time commitment and, um, flying out here is actually a giant pain in the ass because, uh, you have to go to like Palo Alto or, you know, somewhere down in the peninsula. Um, so it, you know, it takes like an hour to even get to the airport, um, and then you've got this like totally insane airspace to deal with once you get up there. So it's just, you know, it's really sort of like nerve wracking and not, not very enjoyable for me. So um, I'm hoping to do more of that, uh, you know, in the, ne- in the coming year and so on. But um, gosh, I flew, I flew to Michigan, uh, I flew to Illinois, lo- lots of little tiny airports for like, they, they call it the $100 hamburger. You just fly to some random tiny airport and there's like a diner there and you eat food and you can get fat and then you go back. Um, <laughs> uh, I think the longest flight I did was to South Carolina from Indiana. That was really cool. I did that. You, you need to have like a long flight to qualify for your commercial license. So that was what I did that for. Cool. That counts as a long flight? That was, uh, it was about 300 miles, I think. It's oh, gotta, nice. It's yeah. got to be over 250 if I remember cool. correctly. Right. Oh, and I flew on a lake. I flew a seaplane. That was oh, really fun. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, so how do you, like, how do you think about when you want to learn a new skill, even if it's a new programming language, I know you got really into like Scala like last year and I don't know, again, stalking her on the internet. Um, how do you decide what you want to learn next or how do you prioritize? Um, most of the stuff that I've, that I've, well, most of the languages that I've really mastered have been languages that I've learned on the job. Um, I think every single job I've gone into, I've had to use a language that, uh, I either had never heard of or, you know, had heard of but never really used or, you know, if I had used it, I didn't, I hadn't used it to an extent that would, you know, make me a professional. Uh, so, you know, I learned Ruby and Rails on the job at the, uh, at the moms and pets websites. Um, I learned Scala at Twitter. Uh, and so it's, you know, like, the thing, the thing that keeps me going is learning new things. And so, um, you know, it's I, I could conceivably still be writing Ruby on Rails if I wanted to. There's still a lot of Ruby at Twitter, uh, despite rumors to the contrary. Um, but you know, I did that for I did that for four years, uh, and I just wanted to try something new. So, uh, so you've been at Twitter for almost four years now, right? Um, how did Twitter find you? I know you kind of glossed over this in your talk, but how did they? Yeah, Twitter found me on GitHub, so thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, so uh, the contribution that I made to that software load balancer turned out not to actually do what I wanted to in the end anyway, um, so I just wrote my own. Uh, and uh, I just got this random email totally out of the blue from Marcel Molina, um, who what, well still is an engineer at Twitter and was at the time. Uh, and he had been, I guess he'd been trolling GitHub for engineers. I don't really, you know, I don't know what the backstory there is. As one does. As one does. Mm. Maybe for dates. I don't know. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> Must write C++. Yeah. Oh, no. That's what That's my OK Cupid says. Deal breaker. <laughs> deal breaker. Uh, Anyway, so he saw the load balancer that I'd written and he, you know, he thought it was, he just, he liked the way it was written and it was in Ruby, so it demonstrated some skill in the language that we were using at the time. So 
I had like the shittiest day that day. And then I got home and I was like, I hate everything. I'm going to take a nap. So I took a nap and then I woke up. It's like 8 p.m. and I opened my laptop uh, and there's this email, Twitter engineering. And I'm like, you assholes. I hate, <laughs> why, why are you playing this joke on me? <laughs> um, but no, it was for real. Um, so how do you think they keep you? I, I mean, like four years and a Twitter, like, I mean, you don't have to go into details if you don't want to, but like, um, what are some of the things that you really love about working at Twitter or have loved? Uh, I love that it's completely insane. Um, it's sort of, I don't want to say it's like an anything goes workplace, but it, it's like, it's the most relaxed and it, I still, I don't know, I've been there four years and I still haven't found a good way to articulate this, but um, it's sort of simultaneously relaxed and intense. Like it's relaxed in all the right ways and intense in all the right ways. People are really intense about, um, you know, wanting, wanting to be good engineers and uh, to build good systems um, that do good things for the world. Um, but, and they're relaxed about pretty much everything else. Um, you know, I don't know, it just feels like my people there. So, and then, you know, the food doesn't hurt, so. <laughs> Big fan of snacks as well, oh, personally. Oh, the cheese. The cheese. Um, so do you work with any other women on the team you're on now? Yeah, so, well, I'm, I'm sort of in between teams, uh, like I alluded to. The, so the, the Ads API team, um, I worked with uh, Sarah Brown, who's really awesome. Um, she joined around the same time I did and was doing front-end development. Um, she made the jump to Scala around the same time I did, I think. Um, so she's pretty great. And uh, my new team, um, I'm going to be working with Sharon Lee, who's, she's going to be my boss. I used to be her boss at Twitter, so the tables have turned. Uh, I'm not really sure in whose benefit, but, but um, yeah, she's, you know, she's fantastic. So. Um, what do you think it's... Uh I mean, this is such like a, a loaded question, but you talked to your tweet from the other day that, uh, that you posted at the beginning of your talk that said, oh, uh, welcome to tech. When you're in a woman in tech, you have uh, two jobs, and that is you know, your regular job and then also being a woman in tech. Uh, what do you think, it like for you, what it's like to work with mostly men? Um, gosh, I, I don't think about it a whole lot. Uh, and you know, be, because I am a trans woman, I have... You know, I have the history of being raised male, and so I, there's. I think you know it's it would be it would be ridiculous to say that that doesn't influence the way that I interact with men. Um, so you know, most of the time, it's it's not really something that's on my mind, um, and especially at Twitter, it's you know we don't really have like. You know, it's not like the we, Wolf of Wall Street. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I think like. One time, somebody put up a flyer on the men's room, but not the women's room, and we fixed that. So, like, that's, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's kind of been hot the drama. Thing there. Yeah, wow, really hot. Although I will say, uh, I did, I did um, have one time where I sat down in the cafeteria, and this guy, uh, an engineer who I hadn't met yet, sat down across from me and introduced himself, and he said, "So, are you in sales or marketing?" <laughs> Oh, motherfucker. Uh, yeah. He no longer works at Twitter. Right. He's, he's dead now. Yeah. So that's a great transition into... Uh, <laughs> uh, I want to... I wanted to ask you if we could talk a little bit about Lambda Ladies and um, uh, what inspired you to start a community uh, for women who want to get involved in functional programming. And also, maybe you could just gloss over what functional programming is for all the younger people in the audience who aren't familiar with that. Sure. Um, functional programming is programming for nerds. I know you already think of programmers as nerds, uh, <laughs> but within the set of nerds, there are even nerdier people. Um, it's, uh, it's a way of... So, Traditionally, the way that one thinks of programming is like a list of commands. You're issuing orders to the computer. Um, you know, and no matter what kind of programming language you're using, ultimately that is what's going to happen you know, on, on the machine code level. Um, but functional programming is more, uh, is more declarative and it's more descriptive. Instead of saying, like, do this thing, you say um, you're, you're literally just writing mathematical functions. And so you say, like, when you when you give this input to this function, it produces this result, um, and it's it's all about you know not mutating any any state, and 
I totally blanked on the second thing I was going to say about that. But um, anyway, it's super hot right now. Super hot. Um, read a lot of medium posts about it. Um, so yeah, so like what, what got you involved in that? Like what inspired you to, to build a community specifically for women who like functional programming? Um, so I can't remember, I can't remember which of the five of us got in touch first. Um, but, uh, so the, the sort of co-founders of the group, uh, Kelsey Gilmore Innes, Susan Potter, Rachel Reese, um, and, uh, I only know her by her Twitter handle, Code Miller. I'm a horrible person. How embarrassing. Um, <laughs> anyway, we originally, we had gotten together because we wanted to do a, uh, a presentation at Grace Hopper about functional programming. Uh, and so, and we called ourselves the Lambda Ladies. Um, we, uh, that proposal got rejected, unfortunately, but we were like, why don't we just start a thing called Lambda Ladies? Um, and we thought like, okay, we're gonna start this Google group and get like 10 people or whatever, but we're like, we're up to over a hundred now already. Um, and it was, I mean, it was just astonishing how much pent up demand there was for this kind of community. That's really cool. Um, finder people is basically like one of those, it's one of those things. Um, uh, so another thing that Dana does that maybe you didn't mention in your introduction was that she actually works with the State Department um, uh, in the State Department here, but working with India on women's issues. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about your work there and how you manage, um, you know, that kind of stuff with all of the work you do in the open source and programming communities. Yeah. Wow. So let's talk about imposter syndrome for a second. <laughs> uh, I got. I don't know if you all, I don't know how many of you have heard of Katie Stanton. She's our uh, VP of International Market Development. Um, and she used to be at the State Department uh, and at Google before that. So um, absolutely astonishing woman. She's really great. Uh, so, but one of her State Department colleagues emailed her, um, I guess about a year ago, uh, asking if she wanted to help out with um, a, a Clinton Global Initiative proposal that they were putting together for uh, getting more women into tech in uh, India and a couple other countries. Um, and, you know, Katie couldn't do this, and so she sent it to me for some reason uh, and two other people, and the other women were like, uh, no way. And I was like, yes, of course I'll do that because I don't read things before I agree to do them. Um, <laughs> kind of how I ended up here. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. I Trapped you. you. Oh. Wah, wah. Now I know whenever I want something from you to just send you an email with right. a blank subject line and yeah. you say yes before you actually yeah. realize what you're committing to. Totally. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so the commitment was uh, to, to go to India for four days with... Um, about a dozen other women from tech companies, uh, all, all kinds of companies like Microsoft and Cisco, I don't, maybe not Cisco, but sort of established like Intel, Microsoft, so on and so forth. Um, and when I got, I got the sheet for this, like the, the State Department schedules things down to the minute. They were like, you are going to pee between 9.04 and 9.08 uh, and then you're going to go to your next meeting at 9.12. Um, and so they have this huge packet that they send you um, before you do anything. And so they, I, you know, I, I get the information for the trip, and I'm looking through all the bio. I had to write a one-page bio as well. That was insane. Um, so I'm looking at all these bios, and it's all like vice president of so-and-so and, you know, C-suite level executive. And here I am, like, software engineer. Um, so I, <laughs> I emailed Katie. Uh, I literally said, what the fuck have I gotten myself into? Uh, I'm totally outclassed here. And she was like, whatever. No, you're not. It's cool. Just go. Um, so I just went. And, uh, and it turned out to be, like, super awesome. And I had lots of, you know, learned lots of great things there. Met with tons of people, you know, uh, government, uh, parliament representatives, um, you know, NGOs that are doing work there for women in tech. Uh, and so on and so forth. So it was, you know, it was a really powerful experience. Uh, and, you know, the proposal got accepted. So that, that program is uh, gearing up to get underway right now. Uh, so it kind of hit you by surprise, but if uh, some of the women here wanted to get involved in programs like that, or even creating something like Lambda Ladies, what's your best advice for them? Um, so they're, the, the, it's sort of weird how this like network of different NGOs in the State Department works. Um, so a lot of the stuff that I do 
um, that involves the State Department is through this group called uh, the International Institute of Education. And they, um, they run all kinds of different programs on behalf of the State Department, one of which is called Tech Women, uh, which is a, a mentoring program for women from the Middle East and North Africa. They, these women apply to come to the States and have like a one month uh, stint at a tech company. And then, um, and then there are professional mentors and cultural mentors that apply from those companies and then they get to mentor these women and so on and so forth. Um, so that's a really good way to get, get involved in it. Um, and usually like, so you do that for a month and you come up with like a, a project for them to work on and um, you know, hang out with them. Like take, they always wanna go skydiving. I don't know what that's about, but. Uh, and then they find out that we don't give them health insurance and they're like, oh, maybe not. That's not such a good idea. Um, but that's a really good way to get involved with that stuff. And then uh, a couple months after you do that mentoring project, um, you, you don't have to, but you have the option to, uh, to visit one of the countries that's represented in the group. Um, so I, I mentored a woman from uh, Morocco, uh, Salima Kessi, in October. Um, and it's coincidental that we just happen to be going to Morocco for the, the travel portion of this, but it's going to be pretty great to go see where she's from. Awesome. Uh, so we have some time to take a few questions from the audience. Does anyone have anything they want to ask Dana? Okay, there you go. Uh, first, okay. Where do you see the technology industry going in the next 10 years? <laughs> the question was, uh, where do you see the technology industry going in the next 10 years? Where's that magic eight ball that we have around here? I have no idea. Um, more cat pictures? Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, if I knew that, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be working for somebody. So. <laughs> Where would you like to see it go? Where would she like to see it go? Is the question. It's, you know, f from an impact perspective, uh, I, well, so one of the things that I think gets glossed over a bit when we talk about women in tech is that there, uh, there are also enormous um, racial disparities in tech. Uh, and I think that that's something that's, um, there, there are programs that are working on this, uh, like Black Girls Code and so on, but um, I, don't, I don't think they're quite getting the attention that they deserve yet. Uh, and so that's that's something that I would really like to see more of happen. And then, you know, the the conflict that's been brewing between the tech industry and um, you know the other citizens of San Francisco. That's 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 got to we, we've got to come to a solution on that. We can't we can't just keep you know yelling at each other and um, expect for something good to come out of that. So, have another question. Yeah, let me, let me. I mean, there's this like amazing quote that's like, uh, you, you put more women at the table because it makes the table a better table. Um, so I don't know if that actually like. Uh, I mean, I see things changing. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, so there, there, there are a couple of problems here. One is that uh, the number of women in tech has actually declined quite a bit since the 80s. Um, it used to be like 35%. This is in uh, computer science majors used to be like 35% and now it's down to like 12. Um, so, you know, as far as getting women at the table, that's, we've got to fix that before, otherwise there aren't going to be any women to put at the table. Um, and, then, and then the women that are in the industry, they're not in positions of leadership. You know, we still have a really big leadership problem. Um, yeah. So that's something that needs, that needs to change as well. Also, I also want to say, uh, it's sort of, 
I don't want to say it's a pet peeve of mine, but I've, I've, I've gotten a little jaded on the idea that like, oh, we should bring women to the table because they have unique perspectives and so on. It's like, well, yes, that's true. You should also bring women to the table because they're people, right? It's like no one is saying the good thing about having the men at the table is that they have male perspectives. It's like, no, they're just there. They just happen to be the people who are working on these problems, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting because... Uh, so I recently read this article about how people have basically ignored feminism on the entire continent of Africa. I mean, there are countries where 64% of Rwanda's uh, parliament is now female. And they did enforce some kind of quota, for, like that's more towards like the perspective, but I mean, it's pushed beyond that. And there are there's a huge feminist movement going on there right now. So there's something about this industry uh, that makes us think that our problems are very like unique and that they aren't being addressed in other industries or other cultures or other countries. And I think if we started paying more attention to how other people are uh, you know, tackling these issues, I think we'd get there a lot faster. I think tech has a lot of growing up to do. I think that's my, uh, that's, that's my bit, my bit for tonight. Uh, yes. Yeah, I've, I've actually got a piece about this coming out on Monday, um, which is that you know when we talk about women in tech, uh, we're talking about we're talking you know women women as a group intersect with all of these other groups, right? When you talk about racial minorities or class or uh, you know sexuality, gender identity, and so on and so forth. Um, and I don't you know and this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier is that I you know I personally don't see that sort of uh, heterogeneity being taken into account in a lot of the, the sort of women in tech solutions, right? Um, I mean, like take the take Lean In for example. It's like yes, let's help upper class women who went to Ivy League schools have careers, it's like by you know reinforcing all of the existing structures in the workplace. Great, sounds awesome. Um, not really for me. So. So yeah, I you know I would agree with you that you know it's it's we you know the the second wave feminism one of the big things about second wave feminism was that uh, the first wave didn't really care about women of color didn't address any of their interests um, it was really just like women's rights at that time were upper class white women's rights um, and one of the whole points of the second wave of feminism was to address that and. So I feel like we run the risk of repeating that mistake. Okay, I'm gonna take two more questions. Too many men have been raising their hands, so I gotta balance this out right now. This, this lovely lady in the front, what's your question? I mean, one of the biggest blockers is uh, there's um, there's almost a, a marketing problem in a way. Like the way that tech careers are described uh, tend to be more appealing to men and boys than they do to women and girls. Um, and there there was there was a study maybe like four or five years ago by like a marketing consulting firm that looked into this, and they looked into the the specific ways that a specific language that was being used to describe tech careers to uh, to college-bound high schoolers, um, and they found that you know if they just if they if they focused on sort of different uh, different aspects of careers in tech, then they could um, not not totally reverse uh, you know girls' disinterest in in getting into tech, but it made a significant difference. Um, so that's that's a big part of the problem, I think. Um, I don't know. It's it's tempting to say that there's just a pipeline problem, but I don't 
I don't think it's that simple. Um, I really think it's about the way that tech careers are positioned in society and how we describe them. And you, I can see you from here, but I can't point. Uh, so there, there were some alternatives. Uh, uh, Garmin, you know, they make GPS units for cars and so on. They also make units for airplanes. Um, but that's no fun, right? <laughs> One more question, maybe? Yeah. The question is, um, how do you find the balance between your two jobs, of one of which your normal job, like your programming job, and um, also being a woman in tech? Um, I have to admit I'm not very good at that. Uh, you know, like I said, I kind of have a habit of saying yes to everything. Um, you know, and I think, gosh, I can't even remember if I gave a talk in November or not. Uh, I did something in November. Uh, and then I swore the rest of the year I'm not doing anything. And then two days later I get three emails from people. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'll totally write that article. I'll totally do this other thing for you. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? Um, so I just, I, you know, got to learn to say no. <laughs> Uh, one thing, I, the second part of your question, actually, about like what other female engineers can do, uh, advocate for other women, um, and also just positive reinforcement. Like I've noticed even in some of the female programmers here that I've sought out specifically and like gone and had coffee with and said, "Hey, I think you're really awesome. Like you should work at GitHub." And I remember a few of them saying, "I'm not good enough to work there." But I don't, I don't feel like I hear that a lot from uh, men. I think I hear that a lot, much more from women. And um, I, so I make it a point to tell the women who I know who are kick-ass that they are, they're kick-ass and that they, you know, deserve everything that any man in this industry has. So advocate for them and uh, reinforce uh, positive things yeah. about them. Yeah. And also advocating for women within your organization, I think, is really big. I, I hammer on this point every time I get to talk to people. There's all this talk about mentorship, which is fine. It's fine to have mentors, but it's way more important, I think, to have an advocate at your company. Um, so Katie Stanton, who I who I talked about earlier, she's um, you know, it, these are all sort of these can be informal arrangements. Some companies have really formalized, sort of like ritualized uh, ways of arranging this. But um, you know, I mean, Katie Stanton just believed that I could do this thing in India, and so she said, "Do you want to do this?" And that was fine. Um, and then. Uh, my boss, for a long time, Rafi Kikorian, uh, you know, he he believed in me, and um, his uh, mentorship is like so. Mentorship is an activity that's directed at you. Advocacy is an activity that's directed at everyone else, and I think you really need to have a lot of that. Yeah, keep opening doors for the women after you. It's ironic. Open the door for Open women. The door. Help them open the door for themselves. Hold it for them. <laughs> yes. Make a, make a grand flourish. Yeah. <laughs> Curtsy. No. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us for Passion Projects. I think Dana's sticking around. So... Thank you.